So my name is Emily Metcalf. Um, I'm a member of the Google Privacy Team, as well as a member of the Gaglers, Google's Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Employee Resource Group. And it is my honor today to invite three speakers from the Transgender Law Center who are here today. Uh, Mason Davis, Alona Turner, and Nathan Harris. Um, they're all going to be talking about the state of the transgender movement. And without any further ado, I will turn it over to Mason. Uh, Thanks em so much for coming. Thank you so much, Emily. Really appreciate it. And we are, we are thrilled to be here today. I have been traveling around the country a lot recently, uh, talking with community members, activists, and policymakers, and I have been struck um, by how excited people are at this moment of history, especially as we wait for a pretty important um, Supreme Court decision or two in the next 10 days. Uh, as early as tomorrow morning, we could hear what happens to the freedom of, to marry for gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender people. Um, we should know what the fate is for the Defense of Marriage Act and for Proposition 8 in California, definitely within the next 10 days. Um, it's been really exciting to see that this, uh, we're at this point in history now where we hopefully will have this freedom. And as I travel around the country, I'm struck by the number of people who feel that it is just a matter of time until people can marry who they love which is awesome. But I am also getting this question, are we done? And that's one question I want to pose to you all today, are we done? Because I'm also hearing from activists and community members and organizations that are saying, once we have achieved the freedom to marry, we are done as an LGBT movement. We have achieved equality. Now, I'll tell you, that's hard for me to reconcile sometimes. At Transgender Law Center, we hear from over 2,500 people a year at this point who are contacting us because they're experiencing some level of discrimination and bias and violence in school, at the doctor's office, at work, and on the street. We know that transgender people are twice as likely to be unemployed and living underneath the poverty level. That's four times as high when it comes to transgender people of color. We know that transgender people are much more likely to be homeless and experience family rejection. In fact, one out of five of us have had to go and live on the streets at some point in our lives. Um, and we know that healthcare continues to be a real challenge for us. Many of us can't get a doctor when we need it the most and have been turned away from healthcare facilities. So when I hear this question, are we done yet? I'm really clear that we are not but that we are at a time when we have to redefine what equality means, what freedom means, what justice means, and to determine whether we're into just us as people or if we're going to continue to fight for justice for all of us. So I'm thrilled to be joined by our legal director, Alona Turner um, from Transgender Law Center. Uh, Alona leads our very small but robust legal team helping people fight for their rights um, in California, nationwide, um, and even occasionally internationally as we figure out how to make sure that all of us have the basic freedoms and supports that we need to survive and thrive. So we're going to be talking to you today about some of the critical issues facing transgender communities across the country, especially issues impacting our youth, issues at work, um, and issues accessing health care. Um, I'm Mason Davis. I'm the executive director of Transgender Law Center and thrilled to be joining Alona today. And before I turn it over to her, I want to make sure, too, that we understand what we're talking about. Because I, I assume some of you are experts and should be up here, um, and other people may be newer to transgender issues. The term transgender is used in a lot of different contexts. It means a lot of different things to different people. So I want to let you know kind of what we mean when we use the term transgender. And at Transgender Law Center, we define transgender as or a transgender person as anybody whose gender identity, the way they feel about themselves, their deep-seated sense of their own gender, or their gender expression, the way they look to the world, doesn't fit the stereotypes associated with their sex at birth. Uh, all of us have a, a gender marker put on our birth certificates when we're first born. Many of us don't have to think about it uh, after that's done. But the truth is, our, the expectations about who we will be as adults are largely based on that first question, is it a boy or a girl? And we put so much expectation about a person based on that answer. And for transgender people and the people who are contacting us, that, that gender marker on their birth certificate doesn't really reflect who they are, um, how they are, 
or what, uh, what they want to be in their lives. So we do a lot of work with people who uh, experience any kind of challenge because they don't fit the narrow gender stereotypes that we typically associate with men and women in this world. And with that, I want to turn it over to Alona, because I know together we're really hoping by the end of today we'll be able to highlight some of the critical issues facing transgender people and also some real opportunities right now to kind of change the game when it comes to transgender equality in the United States. Alona. Thanks, Mason. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the issues that we hear about a lot uh, relating to transgender youth, uh, and especially in schools. Um, as Mason mentioned, you know, there are just unacceptably high rates of family rejection, um, you know, kids being pushed out of their homes when they're transgender or gender nonconforming, you know, LGBT generally, but, you know, the numbers in every case are, tend to be worse for transgender youth. Um, you know, the, uh, so homelessness as a result um, in schools, kids facing harassment, violence, um, and then when kids are dropping out, and that often leads to kids dropping out of school, and so that leads to the other problems that Mason was highlighting of unemployment, underemployment, you know, poverty, homelessness as an adult, involvement with the criminal justice system, you know, you name it. And these problems all build on each other. So to really address that sort of systematic problem, the, the most ef effective way to do so is really to, to start changing things from, you know, with these kids at an early age, make sure that they're actually getting the support that they need and deserve. Um, so that we can hopefully end those, those cycles. Um, and we actually have been seeing some really heartening changes in recent years. Uh, I think partly as a result of increased visibility of transgender people and transgender youth, we're seeing more and more kids coming out as transgender and, and you know, asserting their, their identity and their, their right to be who they are at earlier ages. Um, and I think as a result of the, the increased visibility, we're seeing more and more parents who are, instead of, you know, as they might have done in previous eras, you know, saying, you know, no way, or that's crazy, or, you know, let's get you counseling, you know, they're saying, okay, you know, this is a thing, I've heard of this, what, what can I do to help you? I might not understand it, but, you know, you're my kid and I love you. Um, so those are some of the um, most uh, touching stories, you know, calls that we get. You know, it's, it's just really amazing sometimes to hear from these parents and the journeys that they've gone through. Um, people from all different kinds of backgrounds and, you know, conservative, whatever, you know, but when it comes to their kid, you know, they're not going to let anybody mess with them. Um, you know, so we got one, uh, uh, we worked with one family recently, I'm just thinking of uh, a family, a, a mother, a single mother actually in rural Missouri. Um, uh, whose child is transgender. Um, the mother, you know, had never heard of this before, but the kid was working with a, a counselor who helped explain it to her, and she was like, okay, well, I mean, if you say so, you know, I love my kid. Um, uh, the boy, uh, the child was assigned female at birth, but identifies as a boy, um, goes by the name Trace, and uh, Trace uh, went to school in um, back earlier this year. He's nine years old, um, and in his fourth grade classroom, uh, just before Thanksgiving this year, um, told his classmates that he is a boy. Um, and the school's response was to immediately suspend him for three weeks. Um, and when he got back to school, to put him essentially uh, on lockdown in a special education classroom. He was previously just you know in totally mainstream classroom. Um, and they wouldn't let him out even for lunch or recess. Um, he was the only kid in the whole elementary school who was, you know, seen as this kind of, you know, danger um, for whatever reason. Um, and this mom, again, you know, she's not an activist. She's not, you know, she probably doesn't know any other gay people, you know, queer people. But she knew that, you know, she had to fight for her kid, that, that this was unacceptable. Um, I mean, because he was getting incredibly depressed. He told her that he wanted to die. You know, it was just really, really traumatizing for him and for their whole family. And so she got in touch with us at Transgender Law Center, um, and we were able to successfully advocate with the school, wrote them a very nasty letter, um, <laughs> and they agreed to lift those restrictions on him. And he was so much happier, and they were so grateful, you know, just to, to be able to reach out, you know, and find, you know, that there's somebody in the country somewhere who understands what what they're going through and is able to fight for them. So that was a really uh, one of the most 
meaningful things that I've been able to work on. We got this wonderful letter too, and apparently Trace now wants to move to the Bay Area when he's older and become a lawyer. So that's that's, right. that's a good sign. Yeah, they sent they sent us a little photo um, uh, of him, his class photo, and he's wearing like camo. Um, and then it, you know, we, I was talking to him afterwards, and he said, "Did you get the photo?" And I said, "Yeah." And he said, "Don't I look handsome?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was great. But you know. But of course, unfortunately, you know these calls keep on coming in, and a lot of the issues that we see are around students, transgender students who are struggling at school because the school is refusing to allow them to live as who they are. You know, saying that they can't dress, you know, in a way that matches their gender identity, saying that they can't, um, you know, even if they are living full time as in accordance with their gender identity, and their parents are on board, and their doctor, you know. That this is who they are, and and everybody is on board. The school may still say, nope, you can't. We're not going to call you by the name that matches that. We're not going to call you by the pronouns. We're not going to update your records, and we're not going to let you use the right facilities that match that gender. And um, and we're seeing, unfortunately, a lot of really serious consequences of this. Students who are calling, you know, parents who are calling us about their children getting bladder infections because they won't use the restroom all day. Um, we got a call recently from a parent of a high school student in Ohio who uh, actually just dropped out of high school because she got a number of suspensions for using the girls' restroom after the school said, you're not allowed. But you know, she would like, go in with all her friends. You know, and again, it just really, if you have a student who's living every day in accordance with their gender identity and you're telling them, you can't use the restroom or you can't be in the gym class that matches who you are. That just isolates that student in such a serious way. It really subjects them to stigma and invites harassment, essentially, because you're outing them as different. You know, you're, the school is basically putting a neon sign above their head that says, I'm different. You know, Ask me why. Um, and so we're seeing kids dropping out of school. We're seeing kids being pushed out of school. Um, and so in part as a result of all these calls that we were getting, uh, we're actually working on a bill this year in, here in California. We're sponsoring a bill called AB 1266 uh, that would actually put it into the state law that says that uh, schools have to respect the gender identity of transgender students and allow them to participate in school activities and use school facilities based on who they are. Um, so that's moving its way through the legislature. It's a big deal. This is the first time this kind of bill has been tried anywhere in the United States. Um, it is a, a new concept to some people, and yet we are having transgender youth coming out at younger ages um, who are just uh, a seamless part of the school environment um, who want to just be themselves and want to be able to make sure they have the credits they need to graduate and be able to get out of school and, and live their lives. Um, it, it's incredibly important to us, too, because we know from some data that's been conduct, collected that 50% of transgender youth have attempted suicide by the age 20. Um, the amount of, of harassment that our youth are facing in schools and the impact of that harassment is life-threatening. So we have uh, every, um, every need at this point to make sure that we're able to fix these issues mm -hmm. and so our trans kids are able to be there in schools without harassment and able to graduate like everyone else. Yeah. One last anecdote to, about harassment, just if I may. Uh, we have another client, um, a trans boy high school student from Southern California, who um, was living was one of these people who was just you know fully integrated, you know, living as a boy at, in school. Um, nobody knew that he was transgender until one of his classmates happened to be in the office for something else, the school office, and, and got a glimpse of his record that had an F on it, you know, female. Uh, she took a picture of that with her cell phone, blasted it out to the whole school, and so all of a sudden everybody knows, um, and he starts getting harassed persistently at school. As a result of that, he gets in a fight with one of the harassers, fist fight at school, and he gets expelled. So we're, you know, pursuing a complaint with the State Department of Education on his behalf. But, you know, that just demonstrates, you know, how serious this problem. You know, harassment. It's not just. It's not just about bullying. It's not just, oh, you should toughen up. I mean, this is really leading to a serious problem of, of our kids not mm -hmm. graduating and you know, all of the lifelong problems that that can cause. I know that you guys, we've heard that you guys are, uh, some of you have been thinking about youth issues. Is that right? In the, the Gaglers, this is an issue that 
you all have been focusing on this year. Um, would love to hear some thoughts from you guys if you have any about you know about this issue, trans youth in particular, strategies that that you think might be helpful, questions about problems that trans youth in particular face. Um, you mentioned that there's a family that came to you from, I think it was Missouri or one of the other states, and then Ohio. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming they do so through finding your website. And then you mentioned the other story of harassment intensifying after a picture being taken by a cell phone. And I think maybe it'd be helpful if you talked about how like the internet is enabling or strengthening the movement. And then we could think about like some of the tools that we're developing and how that can maybe like support and intensify the, the work. Sure. Yeah, I, it's, that's a great question. Yeah. So the internet has been absolutely pitiful, pitiful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so pitiful. Um, it, it has been so pivotal in the development of the transgender community and the transgender movement. Yeah. Because for years, transgender people have been part of America and in small towns and all over the country, all over the world. And many of us have lived in isolation. We were scared of sharing our own secret. We didn't know anybody about, you know, like ourselves. Um, a lot of us didn't meet anybody until perhaps later in life. And the internet has really changed that. There are so many resources out there now for somebody who is exploring their identity, thinks, wait, maybe this is me when they see a TV show, and wants to reach out for support. Um, I mean, it's enough of a support area that it's hard for us, to be honest, sometimes in our legal cases, because People are used to creating a community and being very open about what they're going through. And if we're litigating a case of discrimination, the Transgender Law Center finds that our clients have used the internet for so much of a support structure that it is hard for them to, to hold back on what they post um, on, on social media sites. right? The, and for us, it's a concern because it might be confidential or relate to their case. But this is where so many trans people are getting support. It's incredibly critical. And that's especially true for our youth who may be 10 years old in the boot hill of Missouri. And you know, 20 years ago, they wouldn't know a soul for many decades. Now they can go online, their parents can go online, find out information, find connections to support groups, uh, realize they're not alone, and feel empowered to come out much more re quickly and readily than they would, um, and to be themselves at a much younger age than we saw even 10 years ago. Um, even five years ago at Transgender Law Center, we were not getting the kind of calls that we get today from parents before each school year or before summer camp. And a lot of that is because the internet is the place of support. Now that said, it can also be the place of harassment, right? And so to the extent that it can help, it can also hurt as, um, as youth may have social media sites that reflected their original gender and as they change, mm -hmm. they find it hard to get away from that as they um, go through their school years. We get a lot of calls as well from people asking about their privacy because um, somebody may have a, a website, they may have had posts, they may have had a, a documentary they were a part of, and now with the internet there's very little privacy actually. Um, it's very hard for somebody to get away from their previous identities. You and may have people heard of this. Pardon? You may have heard of this concept. Yeah. <laughs> and as you know, more and more information is being added to the internet all the time. And so we get calls from people pretty regularly saying, oh my gosh, I realize that there's this, this you know, story I wrote when I was 10 on this website, or this YouTube video, or uh, this comment somebody's made about me, how do I take this down? And, and so this is a, a really a great thing and a challenging thing when it comes to the privacy and awareness of transgender people. Does that help? Yeah. And, and it would be great to connect with you all. Like when somebody really has something, they're like, oh my gosh, how do I get this down? Um, or if somebody's being harassed online, which happens a lot in the social media sites, how to address that? And I feel like that's an area for us we really have to grapple with to figure out what to, what to do when somebody's identity is being used against them online. Right. We got a call recently um, from a parent in Sacramento, like somewhere in the Central Valley, um, outside of Sacramento. and. You know, it was a mom of a fifth grade transgender girl. And um, you know, it was like, oh no, what's this one going to be? Oh god, what's the school doing this time? And she said, oh no, I just wanted to find out how to get a replacement Facebook password. Or you know, because <laughs> my kid had, because the kid had an old Facebook account from, you know, with the old gender and, and wanted to substitute it. And we were like, 
okay, but like, what's going on at school? You know, what's what's the trouble? And she was like, oh no, they're super accepting. They, they you know, the school worked with us and the, asked the, the kid how, um, when the kid was transitioning, how she wanted to um, make this work. And she said, I want to have an assembly and I want to write a letter and have the principal read it and I'll be standing there. Um, and they did this. And after the, uh, after the principal read the letter, the whole school, students and teachers, all came up and hugged the student <laughs> all together. <laughs> I know, yeah, so we get nice calls also. <laughs> so one of the reasons that youth and education issues are important to us is that we see the really negative impacts if somebody's not able to get a decent education. Um, even if people are able to do well in school, um, we find that transgender people face real barriers to employment. In fact, in California, we did some research a few years ago, and we found that transgender people were twice as likely to have a bachelor's degree compared to other people in the state of California, which is awesome, right? There's a real asset and resilience in this community. And yet, as I mentioned earlier, that we also found unemployment and poverty rates that were twice the general average. Um, and salaries between transgender people who have a bachelor's degree and, trans and, and non-transgender people with a bachelor's degree in the state, uh, there was about a $30,000 pay differential. So we find almost universal rates of employment discrimination and harassment when it comes to transgender people. Thankfully, we, we're not harassed every day walking down the street and at work, or that would just be absolutely exhausting. Most of us find ways to deal with that. But um, it, nationally, 90% have said they've experienced discrimination at work. California, those rates are a little bit better given that we've got some good non-discrimination laws. But still, 70% of Californians who are transgender say they have problems at work. So given that very few of us are independently wealthy, um, we still need to be able to take care of ourselves and our families. So work is really critical. Um, and we want to figure out how do we uh, transition the workplace so that it can be more accepting of people who are different, whether that is um, making sure that um, sex segregated jobs are accessible to transgender people, or looking at what, what are traditional modes of female and male employment and making that more open to everybody, not just transgender people. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Now, it's rare to get really blatant discrimination. Um, oftentimes, the discrimination and harassment people face is much more subtle, because I think we are more sophisticated these days. And to be honest, most people want to do the right thing. They just don't know what that is. But there are times when we get very blatant discrimination that we have to act on and that, where you can't just fix it by education alone. You want to talk a little bit about one big case that we had last year that made a big a precedent, and then we can talk about its implications. Sure, sure. So um, uh, over the last couple of years, we were re representing a transgender woman named Mia Macy, who um, was applying for a job at, with the federal government. Um, uh, she had been working as a police detective in Arizona for 13 years. She was highly trained in ballistics uh, tracking, and, um, and she applied for a civilian job uh, with an, a, a lab of the um, Alcohol, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Bureau, ATF. Um, and when she was applying for this job, she was still living as, as male. She was assigned a male at birth, but coming to realize that she you know, was, uh, in fact, a woman and starting to make that transition. Um, and so she applied for the job. They told her, oh, yes, you're a shoe in You know, you've already been trained on our equipment. You're, you know, by far the most qualified person we could imagine for this job. So she's going through the, the you know, they said, we just have to, like, go through this paperwork and background check, but it's a formality. You know, the job is yours. So she packed up her family, moved from Arizona to Walnut Creek, um, where the job was, and uh, a few, it was like shortly before the job was supposed to start, just a couple weeks, um, she called up the, uh, the lab and said, by the way, I need to tell you, I've just been um, getting my documents updated, updated, driver's license and so forth, um, but I, I, because I'm transgender and so I'll be coming to work as a woman, as Mia. Um, and they said, oh, okay, um, and got back to her uh, just a few days later and said, oh, so sorry, you know, funding for this position has been cut. Um, you know, there's no more job. Um, although she later found out that actually somebody else had been hired with far less experience. Um, so that, you know, so we uh, filed a complaint on her behalf and that went all the way up to the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, last year, and we got a amazing, groundbreaking decision from the EEOC saying that transgender people are protected from discrimination under federal law, under the existing uh, 
sex discrimination law, Title VII. So there's currently no federal law that, like we have in California a law that says that employers can't discriminate based on gender identity or gender expression. It uses those words right there in the law. But on the federal level, we don't have that yet, although there's a, a bill that's been proposed, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and uh, to try to do that um, for both sexual orientation and gender identity. But the, the really exciting thing about this case was that the, this agency that exists to interpret the federal employment discrimination laws said, no, transgender people are protected now already under the existing sex discrimination laws. To, to discriminate against someone because they're transgender is a form of sex discrimination, you know, flat out. And if I can piggyback on that, that's a big deal, right? I mean, it means now that transgender people and gender nonconforming people mm -hmm. throughout the United States um, have legal recourse if they experience discrimination, as long as they work for a company that has 15 or more employees. So in the, the majority of states that don't have uh, LGBT workplace protections, folks can go to their local EEOC office, file a complaint, and have it investigated. It's a really important opportunity for us and moment for us to educate employers, too, that they're on the hook. Um, and that even if you're in the Deep South or in your Missouri where I am from, now you have a legal obligation to make sure that transgender people are able to be treated fairly at work. The other thing that's neat about this is that this interpretation now is also being used in other parts of the federal government. So while it was intended to, do, uh, to determine the, what sex means around employment protections for Title VII, it's also being used by groups like the Social Security Administration as they're looking at their non-discrimination ordinance and, real, and interpreting sex to include transgender people. It's being used by Health and Human Services as they look at the non-discrimination provisions for the Affordable Care Act where they're interpreting sex to include transgender people. It's also true for schools mm -hmm. in, in the federal context. So we now went from, because of this decision, very few federal protections to actually having a lot more legal recourse for transgender people um, when it comes to discrimination impacting the federal government. So it's a real game changer for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thinking about what you said that a lot of people so there's a lot of subtle discrimination against transgender people, right? But there also is a shockingly high amount still of, of calls that we're getting of, of where employers really just don't seem to realize that they have any legal obligations and are still, you know, especially in certain parts of the country, saying things like, you know, if, if an employee comes out as transgender, saying, oh, you know, I just, we just don't think that the other employees would be comfortable having you here. Or um, we have a client in South Carolina who was fired after, um, after she came out as transgender. She hadn't started transitioning yet, but her employer or her supervisor let her go uh, just a couple weeks after she came out um, and said, I'm sorry, you know, we're re a religious company and I just think what you're doing is wrong. Um, and then she was actually denied unemployment when she went to you know, claim that after she was fired uh, because they, pu they put that she was fired for cause and the cause was intent to violate the company dress code. Huh. So yeah, they're really willing to you know be pretty blatant about it, and that makes our job easier for sure, um, <laughs> because you know that just yeah we just say look at that that's definitely discrimination. Um, sometimes it, it's more subtle though. I mean, and we see we get a lot a lot of calls about harassment that transgender people are facing on the job, and sometimes it's subtle, and sometimes it's more blatant. A, a lot of it has to do with pronouns. Sometimes employers or coworkers have a hard time remembering what pronoun to use and you know that's normal within a certain range right like people might make a mistake but if it happens over and over again especially after the person is corrected or instructed by their supervisor you know hey that's not cool um, that's actually really offensive and, and hurtful to that person um, then it crosses the line into kind of legally actionable harassment we just recently settled the case on behalf of a police officer here in the Bay Area who was, uh, went through this, you know, he transitioned to male uh, a few years back and his you know, fellow police officers just could not accept this. And they would just, a, a group of them would just repeatedly call him by female pronouns, ask him to come out and pat down female su uh, suspects, even though he's a guy. Um, and they would also out him to other, to new staff. So even people who had never worked with him when he was presenting as female um, would start calling him by female pronouns and doing the same harassment. So really problematic and we got a, a nice settlement for him from, from the department. Yeah, and the, 
making mistakes occasionally is fine. We all understand that. Um, but what Alona's talking about is, is oftentimes people will say, I, I just have a block. I, I can't accept who you are. Um, I just can't get this. And that's when you really have a problem, right? Um, but there's a lot of unintentional stuff that does happen in the office. I, I, so I'm a transgender man myself. I was born female. I went through a lot of steps and work and years to be who I am today. Um, and my last job before I was at the Transgender Law Center was a much larger organization. And I would come out to my friends um, as transgender. I, I've done activism in the transgender community for 15 years. Um, and so it's not something I hide, but it also wasn't my work. So it wasn't the first thing I told people. It wasn't on my forehead yet. Now it is. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I had a really well-meaning friend uh, who I met, one of my coworkers, who uh, I still remember very vividly. We were in our kind of break room where all of our mailboxes were and our coffee. And, and we had just met, really nice gay guy. And he's like, so when did you have the surgery? So do you have a <laughs> genital part? And I'm like, I am in my office, um, in the mail, with, where everybody comes to get their mail, with the coffee. Um, my genitals should not be a topic of conversation here, right? He was really well-meaning. Um, he he's become a real, he, he was clueless um, at the time. And he was trying to connect with me and show that he was supportive. And he really put a foot in his mouth, right? Um, that's kind of what not to do. He didn't mean to discriminate against anybody. He wasn't trying to be harassing. But it was definitely anxiety pro provoking as I looked around to see who all was there, right? And tried to figure out how to respond to that in our break room at work. Um, so some of this is to be really thoughtful about, is this a question you would want somebody to ask you at work? Um, are you asking about somebody's private medical information? Um, are you asking because you have a reason to know? Or you're just curious? And generally, try to stay away from the just curious questions, at least until you have a more intimate relationship um, with that coworker. Does that make sense? Now, that's different than the time in the same job when I got a call from one of my staff who had quit a couple weeks beforehand. Um, and she had worked with me for a couple of years. And she said, Mason, I felt like I needed to call you because nobody wanted to tell you. But for the last four years, you have a staff person, a colleague, who's taking all of your new staff and interns out to lunch and telling them that they're really working for a woman and, um, and making fun of you every time you turn your back. And I'm sorry nobody told you that for four years. Nobody wanted to hurt your feelings. But I thought maybe you should know. I needed to know. I mean, I'm so glad that they called me, right, and that they trusted me. But this is somebody I worked with every day in a relatively small department who was very actively trying to undermine me uh, with staff. I mean, they were not doing that out of an area of mistake. Maybe he had some curiosity. But this was pretty clearly. Um, somebody who was not happy that they were working with a transgender person and wanted to make sure all of my colleagues knew that. Um, now, that was the one time in my life I have called up, up HR and said, we've got a problem. Um, I'm going to hope that I, and assume that that's, folks know better than to do that these days. But if somebody does share that they're transgender with you, um, ask them, like, is that information you'd like to have widely shared? Um, is that um, private information about their background that they're sharing with you? Um, and to really respect that. It's oftentimes a little nerve wracking for a transgender person to out themselves for the first time, um, especially if they tend to just blend into the woodwork, which, to be honest, most folks don't think I'm transgender when I first walk into the room. So to really be aware of that and, and go to the not you know, do unto others as uh, you want them to do to you, but do unto others as they want to be done to them, right? <laughs> So I'm wondering in Google, and if, if, if Emily, if you could do an Oprah again just for a second, like where do you see some of the unintentional um, harassment um, happening? Or is, are there opportunities for that to happen unintentionally, where a transgender person can have their toes stepped on without folks realizing it? Whether that's through the systems that you have or, or interpersonal relationships. And I know I'm asking for folks to be a little, to take a little bit of a risk here. But I'm going to, I come from the assumption that Unintentional bias happens all the time uh, for people who um, don't experience the same kind of prejudice or oppression that some other folks around them do. Anybody willing to take a risk? Where might it happen? Okay, I'm actually an intern. Um, the things I've noticed in the past two days is <laughs> there's very little gender neutral bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Very few gender neutral bathrooms. 
So as we talked about the issue of schools, this gender neutral bathrooms or bathrooms at work are a big deal too. Um, and not everybody feels comfortable going into a men's room or a women's room. A lot of folks are afraid they're going to face more scrutiny. They may have had experiences with harassment. They may feel, not feel comfortable with either of them as choices. And we definitely see a movement to creating gender neutral bathrooms in a lot of spaces. Um, the Washington DC, for example, they passed an ordinance that every single stall restroom in Washington has to now be a gender neutral restroom that can be ac accessed by anybody. And that's good for transgender people. Um, it's also good oftentimes for people with disabilities who may need an assistant. It's good with families with young kids. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons to, to embrace gender neutral bathrooms and we're finding more workplaces that are using that as an option. Now we never say that transgender people should be forced to use a gender neutral restroom though. Um, that anybody should have access to that and it, folks should be using restrooms that match who they are and where they're going to feel most comfortable. Thank you for sharing that. So that's one structure in a lot of companies that most folks don't think about but can create kind of an unintentional barrier um, for some of the employees. Anything else folks want to share? Um, in Cambridge, um, one thing that I get when I first joined Google is that the women in engineering group is very aggressive about trying to get new engineers who happen to be female to join. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very awkward, I do not want to join, this is the nth time you ask me where I'm just getting kind of large, well why don't you want to join? That's not really any of your business. Uh. Um, so it's unintentional and they're just trying to be nice and it's cool that they're doing that because in general, that is a positive response, but yeah. It's, it's, yeah, unintentional weird things. Thanks for sharing that. That's a great, that's a great example. Right, and I think that just raised awareness about the fact that, that transgender people exist, that maybe everybody doesn't identify the way that you might think that they do based on, you know, your um, scan of them, um, you know, that, that can make a big difference in just being respectful and, and not pushing things like that. But I think one really good thing that, obviously I'm coming from university where people are very aware of this and there's a lot of talk about it. Um, there's a lot of introductions, my name is this person and this is where I'm from and anything else. But there's never, this is my preferred gender pronoun and mm -hmm. that way people know, because it is confusing, people don't know how to read me. Like, what, like which one, right? Um, but if you just have that into your introduction, people will know. Yeah. and then they won't mess up. We had a new staff person start this week and, um, and I checked myself yesterday and I said, you know what, actually I realize I've been referring to you as he, but I don't know if that's the pronoun you prefer. What is your, can you share what your preferred gender pronoun is? And he said, wow, thank you for asking, it is he, but what's up with the Bay Area that people don't ask that? Because he comes from New York, he's like, in New York we're all asking that all the time. It's, part of just respect and, and not making assumptions. So it is a, a great practice too, especially if you aren't certain of somebody's gender, it's really okay to ask, right? right. Um, and, and some of us are uncomfortable with that. Somehow we're supposed to know this, right? But not, it's not always possible. Right, and I think your question also points out that it doesn't ha a way to do that that's even more inclusive and respectful is to start by sharing your own, you know, if you if you meet somebody that you're not sure or you're in a, a group setting, you know, just to sort of make it a universal question and information, you know, my name's Ilona and my preferred pronoun is she, you know, that opens it up and doesn't put all the scrutiny, you know, on that transgender person, you know, like, oh, I'm assuming that you're different, you know. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate people who've taken the, the risk of sharing. I think it's helpful and I would encourage you all to normalize some of that conversation too because unintentional bias happens everywhere with so many folks and um, to the extent you can kind of share, hey, this is how this impacts me, I think it, it will help Google to continue to be a leader in this area. And I also think whether it's in the Gaglers or other work groups to talk through, um, you know, what are ways that Google and other companies can kind of address unintentional bias that can emerge, whether that's interpersonal or structural. So the last thing I want to talk about in, 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 in workplace is um, some of the strategies that we're seeing that are really helpful at this point. I mean, one is looking at corporate policy. That's been really important, especially as large companies have um, integrated transgender issues uh, into corporate policies has been very helpful for folks. Um, as Alona said, there's a real push towards Title VII and making sure we have federal workplace protections, both through Title VII and the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And we're seeing more and more states that are passing uh, strong, comprehensive non-discrimination laws in the states as well. That's all great. Um, 
and we need to make sure things are really happening on the ground. So there's some really neat programs that are evolving across the country right now in this movement uh, where we're seeing kind of homegrown job programs for transgender people. Here in, in San Francisco, there's a Transgender Economic Empowerment Initiative and is also included, a, they've got a program uh, related to it, I think it's TransCode, is that what it's called, right? That's actually teaching transgender people how to do coding. Um, we've got a lot of folks who come from the tech world and to the extent they've been able to help people get a foot into the door in the tech field, that's been really awesome. Especially given that many of the tech companies have been the most embracing um, of folks who are different and including transgender people. So nice job on that, I really <laughs> love it. Um, and I just want to mention that as we're being more successful, as we're seeing more visibility both with our youth and in the workplace, and as we're getting more passage of non-discrimination laws, we're also seeing more backlash. Did anybody pay attention to Arizona? Has anybody seen Arizona in the news recently? Yeah. So Arizona had a pretty interesting bill uh, that they had introduced this year. The city of Phoenix passed a city non-discrimination law to protect transgender people from discrimination, which is awesome. I mean, in a lot of states where you aren't, they're not ready to pass a state law, city laws have been really important. Well, a legislator, John Kavanaugh in Arizona, did not like the fact that there had been this bill passed in, in Phoenix. So he introduced his own law for the state, which would make it a, a criminal penalty for a transgender person to use a restroom that did not match the gender marker on their birth certificate. Now, many of us cannot change the birth certificate gender marker, depending on where we're from. All of that's managed on the state level. Um, as somebody from Missouri, I could have them add my new name and gender, but I can't have them take away the old one. Um, in some states, you can't change it at all, right? So your birth gender is your gender as far as your birth certificate. Well, Kavanaugh's bill would have put somebody in jail for six months for using a restroom if it didn't match their, the birth mark, their birth certificate <laughs> gender marker. Um, thankfully, there was an uproar. Um, I mean, and this actually passed the first committee, right? This was a bill that really had uh, some legs in Arizona. It was very similar to the anti-immigrant bill that they had there where, again, another show your papers uh, bill in Arizona. Thankfully, folks were able to rally together and to make it clear that this would be ridiculous. I mean, the logic of that bill would say that I have to use the women's room in Arizona, and I'll tell you, nobody really wants that. <laughs> um, and, and we were able to stop that. But the, what happened with Arizona and Kavanaugh is a good symptom of uh, an issue we're gonna see arise. And it's true for almost every civil rights and, and social justice movement in this country, that the more you progress and the more you have success, the more backlash you will see. And we are starting to see this as we are seeing more harassment of people who are out as transgender. We're seeing more kind of anti-transgender bills that are being proposed. And many of those have to do with restrooms because to be honest, the United States Folks, we do not like bathrooms. We do not like public restrooms. Uh, we think they smell. Um, we don't want to. We want to avoid them as much as we can. Doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man. It, it's just not a popular place. And anti-transgender people realize this and have tried to pair up um, non-discrimination laws with restroom issues in a way that's been really damaging for a lot of folks. Um, so I do urge you to keep an eye on this. I'm hope with Arizona that he finally realized this was not going to work and pulled the bill back. But this is really the next frontier that we're going to have to continue to fight as the success that we see also has an, an equal and opposite reaction to it. Um, you want to talk, talk about healthcare quickly? Yeah. Um, so just in a couple minutes, um, the last issue we wanted to talk about was um, healthcare. You know, this is a major issue um, for a lot of transgender people. Just simply being able to access health care at all in some cases, you know, being turned away, um, being denied uh, health insurance because of having a, um, because they are transgender, which is viewed as a pre-existing condition, um, being transgender people being denied sex-specific care that they need just because of the, you know, because they may have changed their gender marker with the insurance company. So we see transgender men being denied pap smears that they need, transgender women denied prostate exams, um, and some people being denied care for, I don't know, a whole range of bizarre sounding uh, reasons. We had a client who was denied uh, treatment for a broken bone because the insurance company said, oh, that must be related to the hormones that you're taking, uh, must have weakened your bones, and so we're not going to cover it. Um, and, and this is related to the fact that m 
a large percentage, the majority of health insurance plans in this country right now have explicit exclusions written into them for uh, health care that transgender people need. Thankfully, this is changing. There is a, a surge of activism to address this issue, especially as the Affordable Care Act is about to be implemented throughout the United States. And there now have been four states in the, in the District of Columbia that have now said that it is no longer legal in those states to have transgender specific exclusions in healthcare policies. Thank you. Thankfully, California is one of those states. So this is a real sea change where we now have a, a good percentage of states that are now starting to look at this issue as they're doing implementation around the Affordable Care Act and looking at opportunities to make sure that all people are actually able to have the coverage they need, including transgender people. Uh, there have been some real interesting focus groups around the country to learn ab about what people know about the Affordable Care Act. And what we've heard is transgender people are among the most vocal because we have so much to gain or to lose with what's happening. So for folks who are interested in getting involved in that or learning more, please come talk to us afterwards. We're tight on time, so I want to make sure we give our last few minutes for any questions folks may have. I just want to add yeah. one last thing on the healthcare front, which is that we're also seeing a lot of action from employers, you yeah. know, and um, including uh, Google yeah. um, was one of the pioneers in this area, um, and it's so helpful when when that sort of thing happens, um, especially from such a prominent company. You know that can be used as an example. You know can set an example for other companies to say this isn't impossible. You can negotiate with your health insurance company. You can make this happen, um, and it, right. it makes such a difference in the lives of of trans employees. Makes people more productive, happier. Um, it's just should be a no brainer, but it's really helpful to have. Um, this kind of example. Yeah. So I hope you all will join me in realizing that we're not done even as we get hopefully a great ruling from the Supreme Court in the next 10 days. We have a lot more work to do um, around school and our youth, around jobs, around health care, around a myriad of issues impacting our community. And as we get into the last five minutes of questions, would love to hear any clarifying questions you all may have here. Um, and also any ideas you have of how do we spread the word to make sure people realize that we're not done, that we have not ended at all the long march to equality, but we have a lot more work to do. And if you have thoughts about that, uh, we would love to hear it. We're starting some social media campaigns at this point. Mm. One is called More Than Marriage, um, hashtag More Than Marriage, uh, really elevating a lot of the issues that have impacted, especially more marginalized members of the LGBT community making sure people are talking about the need for, still for education and healthcare and immigration and so many issues that have not had the same kind of media presence but continue to be really critical for our communities. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll open up for questions and ideas. Um, as you might know, Google's mission is to uh, organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that a lot of folks are finding out about transgender issues via the internet at yeah. a younger and younger age. Um, what might Google or other tech companies be able to do to help um, the younger generation find out um, what they need to know to transition earlier in their lives? It's a great question. I think there are a lot of little things. There's probably a bigger one, too, that I want some more time to think about. But I mean, some things that we've talked about in our office, you all have, I don't, I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know what you call them. But the images that show up when you first do the, the search engine, mm. um, when you first go to Google, what do you call them? Doodles. Your doodles. Yes, I love the doodles. I just didn't know what they were called. I apologize. Um, <laughs> but we've talked about how powerful it would be to have an LGBT or especially a T doodle at some point, um, maybe on a, you know, some sort of day that we could commem commemorate. That would open up that, this issue to so many folks. Um, you know, how do we make sure that the organizations that are doing really interesting work, and especially those working with youth that provide more public education, making sure that they're able to be high up on the search engine results, right? So people find that. I mean, I think there's been a lot of improvement. It used to be if you searched for transgender, you would not get advocacy groups. I'll just say that. Um, you would get a lot of adult content. And that has already changed significantly over the years. Thank you. So that people, people can now get some basic information. But we have a lot of different sites out there that are, have pieces of information. We have yet to really have a lot of that in one place that's easily accessible, especially for the kids. So it might be interesting to think through how do we make sure that that is uh, much easier to find for folks. And then I guess the last thing I want to reiterate earlier, I think the harassment issue is real. So what can we do to address um, when people are being outed uh, online, if they're being harassed? 
um, in the social media sites. What do we, how do we address that? Um, I feel like that's, we feel a lot of urgency around that right now. Thank you, guys. Uh, before the talk, you were chatting about um, issues like symbology and branding, for example, for Transgender Law Center. Speaking more broadly, how do we develop um, how do we develop, um, you know, iconography or or um, representatives, heroes of the trans movement? Yeah. How do we, you know, what do we have to rally behind? What what people? What images? What symbology? We don't have as much as the broader LGBT That's movement right. yet. Are we are we moving in that direction? Do we have poster children heroes? What do we have? Did, did, did you, you have an answer back there? There's an inherent tension for organizations like TLC, and I think you and I have had a version of this conversation in terms of um, how bold the, uh, its logo is in terms of mm -hmm. they're sending letters to people and having an envelope that necessarily outs the people on the other end is, is problematic. Uh, on the other hand, I've, I personally feel really strongly we need something that is the equivalent of the HRC equal sign. We need something that that absolutely says um, in unambiguous terms, trans, that unambiguously says proud, um, and um, uh, and you know there are there are other organizations, there are other non-organizations. A woman named Jen Richards in Chicago has a project called We Happy Trans. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, which is all about promoting um, positive images of uh, trans people post-transition. Um, and um, for this exact purpose, she ran an event called Trans 100, which Mason was one of the uh, uh, people who was highlighted. Um, uh, and you know, identifying people who are, um, by action, by visibility, um, by impact, um, you know, heroes, um, you know, significant people in the in the in the trans um, uh, movement. But yeah, we need something that's like the HRC equal sign that isn't just TLC. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I totally agree with that. I mean, the Trans 100 I think was great. Um, they did an event in Chicago, um, did social media and and print media around kind of a hundred people who have been active and made a difference in the trans movement. Um, that was a real watershed in part because most of the media around transgender people has been like the Day of Remembrance is our best known day, which commemorates all the people we've lost to, to anti-transgender violence. Um, I mean, we've had a lot of things where we commemorate people who have died, but usually through violence or, or HIV and AIDS, which disproportionately impacts our community. There have been very few um, campaigns to really get out the good stories. I mean, we have folks who have contributed so much in so many different fields, many people don't know it. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that, but I do think we're ready to be much more visible, um, much more powerful as a people and as a movement. We have yet to find that equal sign moment. There are, is a transgender symbol, but it's, uh, it's a little clunky in my uh, opinion. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I think we're getting there. And if any of you are great strategists and graphic designers, let's work together to create that. Um, but it, it is time. It, it, in many ways, we're very much like where the gay and lesbian movement was 20 or 30 years ago where the media representations were as victims or killers um, or the joke, right, of, of, um, of the sitcom. And we're ready to move. Um, we, uh, we, we're ready to go um, and have our moment. We have a lot of needs. We've got a lot of momentum. Um, and I do think that this is a moment for us to really make this a reality. What I want to make sure to do before we um, end the talk is to announce that for those of you who aren't aware, um, Go Transgender has a lot of information about resources on transitioning and transgender issues at Google, including a uh, list of gender neutral uh, bathrooms in various buildings. Awesome. So um, that's a really great resource. And can I also just say thank you all? I mean, Google has been a leader in policies uh, supporting transgender people here on the job. Uh, you've had great health care. hope it continues to be great health care. Um, I see nods. That's awesome. Um, I'm so um, grateful for you all and your leadership in this, and also your support of Transgender Law Center and of this movement. Uh, it's made a big difference to us, and look forward to continuing to partner together. Thanks. Yep. Thanks so much, and please, everybody give a round of applause for our